Well, it is a great privilege to be included in this circle. It's really um, such a gift. Every uh, contribution has been uh, truly straight from the heart of the Logos, um, or from Sophia. Uh, really, I've, I've learned uh, so much already in a, in a day and an evening, and thank you. Uh, I came to the living uh, Bruno Barnhart through one of his books, uh, uh, The Good Wine, uh, Reading John from the Center. This book came as a revelation to me. It was such a uh, brilliant production uh, and a way of looking at the Gospel of John that I had never seen anything remotely like it before. And what was most striking to me about it, uh, the sapiential underpinning, uh, of course, was was the uh, foundation, but was his idea that the Gospel of John was arranged as what he called a word mandala. Uh, and I think you could also call it a story mandala. It's not just uh, words, but it, they were the positioning of stories in an array, a complex array that created a mandala. And that had a center, as all mandalas do, the most important part of the mandala, and that radiated out around it. Uh, he contrasted it to the chiasm, the rhetorical uh, writing uh, device in Greek literature, which takes uh, propositions and moves them through a center to the other end. Very simple, an X. But rhetorically, it's a very powerful device and, and makes for a complicated argument, but one that is very clear at the same time. And he blew this up into this much, much more complex picture of a word model that radiates in all the directions, filling in the circle around a center. Found this absolutely interesting. And simply the idea that John is a mandala. That was a very powerful idea to me. Um, Carl Jung has, uh, did, uh, C.G. Jung did some very, very important work on mandalas. And um, one of the things uh, I'd like to say from him about mandalas, the meaning, why would we be talking about a ma mandala in uh, a colloquium on wisdom? Uh, the mandala, Jung said, manifested spontaneously in the lives of, say, he, he said, 12-year-old children whose parents were going through divorce. He saw this in his patients. The mandalas would manifest within their dreams or in their writing uh, or in their artwork. Uh, or in uh, the lives of uh, young adults uh, who were having uh, uh, psychotic breaks. Their world was breaking apart, literally. And he said this about the function of the mandala. The mandala was a deeply centrated figure that was nature's attempt to heal herself. Wow. Now that's very interesting to me because at, at that moment, He's first talking about individuals, an individual girl, an individual boy, uh, a 22-year-old young adult, and then suddenly he's also referencing the whole community, the whole community being healed, nature healing herself. So the individual in this picture is placed within a larger context, a community context, that is being healed by gaining a new center when a center has been lost. So the centration is quite an important idea. Gaining this center uh, is reintegrating the shattered self, the shattered nature, the shattered community. OK, so um, that was uh, you know, simply very, very interesting to me. And then I had, then we moved to California. Then I learned he lived here. And, uh, and I met Rick. And uh, you know, I was led to Bruno. and uh, he became my spiritual director, and uh, we talked about this. And then uh, through Grace Cathedral, my cathedral, the cathedral where I serve, the seat of the bishop, as, uh, <laughs> as Matthew Fox said to a crowd with me present, uh, it's, the bishop is only keeping it warm for ISIS. Um, <laughs> it's the seat of the goddess, um, the, the bishop's seat. Uh, there's historical truth to that. Um, but anyway, at Grace Cathedral, Alan Jones, the former dean of the cathedral, had these wonderful forums where we never paid a penny for any of the forum guests because they were all on book tours. And they were very happy to come and speak to Alan and have his wonderful kind of 
interlocutor uh, conversation. He's a very urbane, civilized, uh, thoughtful person. And uh, one of those people was uh, a graduate of the school where I am, but in the psychology department, East-West Psychology, Alexander Shia. And Alexander has written four or five books all around the same idea, a rich idea, uh, and that is what he calls quadratos, the uh, four gospel pattern of transformation that he reads in the um, canonical gospels in a different order. Now, the different order I call the wisdom order, the wisdom order of the Gospels. So when um, the liturgical reform started taking place in 1962, um, one of the things that was reformed was the lectionary. And the lectionary was reformed such that it was uh, patterned af after the lectionary in pre-6th century Christianity, first through 6th centuries, as far as we know. Some of no lectionaries for the very, very early time, but the lecture, lectionaries of the early church. And the difference was that there's an interruption by the Gospel of John during Lent and the Easter season. That, you know, you're reading along in one of the synoptic Gospels, and suddenly in those seasons, John is inserted. And we have restored that. But as Alexander pointed out, we restored it without knowing why we restored it. There was a reason why that happened during the Easter season. And the reason that he discerned, and I would say that, this, uh, that Alexander's reading of uh, this gospel pattern is as um, intuitive and sapiential as uh, Bruno's. You can't prove this stuff. <laughs> but it has the ring of truth about it, at least to me. Uh, so he said that there is a deep underlying life pattern of transformation related to each of the four Gospels as a whole that goes in what I call the wisdom order. To put it very simply, there is a life question at the heart of each of the four Gospels. And those questions are progressive, that you move through them in this wisdom order. So they begin with Mark. The canonical order and the wisdom order are the same as long as you are with the first two Gospels, Matthew and Mark. Uh, so the, the question in Matthew is, how do I encounter change in my life? And the Gospel of Mark raises the question of how do I cope with suffering in my life? John the word mandala of, of Bruno is, how do I receive blessing? How do I enter into the garden of blessing? And then uh, Luke is, how do I serve? So when I read this, it was, it, his work is very powerful as well. I realized that these two could move together. Alexander's work and Bruno's work uh, were actually two pieces of the same thing, which was a more complex mandala. The mandala was not just John by itself, but rather John was the center of the larger four gospel wisdom mandala. And uh, so a few more words about mandalas in general. Uh, from, from India and Tibet, what we understand about mandalas uh, is that we see them as static and two-dimensional. Uh, the the devotee of the mandala does not see them in that way. They are dynamic, they're in motion, and they are three-dimensional. So they are a spiral that is uh, ascending. So you might think about uh, the Divine Comedy in a Western context, and the movement through from hell with its circles uh, through Purgatorio, through Paradiso, uh, and, and if you remember in Paradiso, you've got all the motioning around of the planets, and then you have the uh, movement and the singing, uh, the, the rose itself at the center in Empyrean is uh, also in motion. All of it's in motion. So it is with the mandala. The center of the uh, mandala in India and Tibet is uh, the lotus. But in the center of the center is a figure. Uh, often the Buddha. 
uh, could be uh, Shiva, Shakti, together, um, but in Buddhism, the Buddha. And above them is the sun, shining down, illuminating. So if uh, you think about the model as you've seen, you are between the sun and the center. <laughs> it's that three-dimensional. You're in this as someone who sees it. Another thing to say about it, and this is a differentiation between the West and the Rose, and I'm calling the mandala of John the Rose, mm -hmm. uh, and the Lotus in the mandala of the East, uh, is that um, the figure in the center of the center is what the devotee becomes. So in, in, if it's the Buddha in the center, you meditationally put yourself into the place of the Buddha and become the Buddha. And there's one text, in fact, where the lotus closes around you. Uh, and in the darkness of the uh, enclosed flower, you, you go, undergo further transformation and then it opens and there you are. Yeah. But that is not so in uh, the Christian use of, of the mandala. You never become God. Uh, so there's a, a, Jung points out that there's a, a difference there uh, in that regard. So uh, I began to think this, is, um, this mandala in the West might have worked like this. Uh, you journey inward towards the center with Matthew and Mark from the question of how do I, at this out, outer perimeter, how do I uh, encounter change? And then how do I deal with suffering? which takes you into the center, which is the rose. And uh, in the center, we learn what our, what our purpose is in serving the world, and with Luke, we spiral back out uh, to, to the outside to serve. Um, another thing Jung said about uh, the mandala is related to the directionality, the, the spiraling movement. In cultures like uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, where the mandala is culturally approved, where it is held within the culture as a path that is recognized, the movement uh, is generally clockwise. But in a culture where it is not supported by the culture, typically the spontaneously produced mandala of the patient seeing Jung or dreaming on her own is counterclockwise. The movement is seen as going counterclockwise. So you got all those things? <laughs> Christian baptismal fonts look like this. They have equal armed crosses. And now that would indicate, uh, actually, I think, uh, a slight development of the idea of the mandala that I'm discerning uh, between Alexander Shia and Bruno Barnhart. Uh, because the four pieces, the four elements, very quickly become the four evangelists. The symbols, the um, symbols of the four gospels go into those arms. So very, very early, um, maybe not this early, there, there's nothing there uh, at this stage. Uh, but this is, first, it's not the cross of history with the longer vertical and the shorter horizontal. This is the uh, cross of the cosmos. Uh, this is the cross of the mandala, the, the equal arm cross. And it's the cross associated with baptism, always with baptism. And, and there are hundreds of examples of these baptismal fonts from the first to the third century that look almost just like this. Uh, so that's interesting. If the four gospels become the symbols, which are the winged man, Matthew, the winged lion, Mark, the eagle, John, and the winged bull, Luke, become the uh, four terminus points of the cross, then something else is in the center other than John. Something's replaced John in the center, or it's working differently. So I don't know. Okay, the next page is truly fascinating. I went on a search. Um, because I made a, a, a presumption. If this wisdom pattern, which I call a mandalic process, 
Uh, it would also, if it obtained, as Alexander Shia said, in the Christian world for the first six centuries of Christianity, then I made a presumption that somewhere there would be graphic representations of it. It wouldn't just be a community process that would have no graphic expression. So I started to look for, were there mandalic expressions of the mandalic process of the four gospel question progression uh, somewhere in the wisdom order? So you see, that's what I was looking for. I would always look for Mark first, I mean Matthew first, Mark second, but then John would come third rather than Luke, and Luke would come last. So while I was looking, and bearing in mind um, Bruno's word mandala, I found this, Dura Europas, the oldest church we know of. And these images are on the walls of the baptistry in that church, and they are all from the Gospel of John. Uh, and the one on the top left is uh, the Good Shepherd. You can, they're very primitive uh, images. They're very beautiful in a, in a kind of primitive way. Um, but there you see the Good Shepherd, uh, an image only found in the Gospel of John. Next to it, you have uh, Jesus healing a paralytic. He's picking up his uh, bed and walking. Next to that uh, fragment, uh, Jesus walking on the water. Uh, below that, to the left, you have uh, uh, Jesus, the women coming to the tomb. And then the Samaritan woman by the well is uh, on the bottom right. Not pictured is a very, very damaged image that would be, if the baptistry is here, <clears throat> above it you have uh, the Good Shepherd. And then these other images that you see are arrayed to the right. And, but there is, there is an image on the left uh, from the Hebrew scripture, David and Goliath. Very interesting. It's, it's very damaged, so I didn't have it reproduced. So there we have a, uh, a kind of graphic repre representation of the word mandala of John, which I am calling the rose in the center of this mandalic process, uh, around baptism, which is the process of transformation of, of the community and of the individual. One of the things that Alexander points out is that in um, processes of community, uh, individual transformation, the elders of the community, for instance, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Native American communities will say that the elders die when the young women and young men return from their vision quest because the community changes. So the community is changed when any one person is baptized within it. Uh, so it's a, it, everyone is implicated. And thus, in, in the uh, post-Vatican II uh, practice of liturgy, one, we cease baptizing uh, children apart from the liturgy on Sunday. Well, we mostly did. Sometimes I do that. Um, <laughs> don't tell. Um, but we also, uh, everyone reaffirms their baptismal promises in the context of one person's baptism, we are all dying and being raised to life again in the baptism of a single person. We're all being baptized. So um, I, I then started looking for these images, and lo and behold, there are many of them. Many of them. I looked for the, oh, the other criterion I used is that they should be as old as possible. I looked for the ones that were close to the period that Alexander said, that this uh, wisdom order, as I call it, the mandalic process would be alive in the church. And um, so there are not many from that period, um, like the uh, Rabula Gospels from Syria date from the 6th century. Uh, there are no images within that beautiful, beautiful illustrated gospel of, um, of the Gospels, figures, um, but I, I got as close as possible. Here you have the Book of Kells on the next page. Uh, so can you see a pretty, and it's not the best reproduction, but if you start in the top left, you have uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the winged man, to its right. Now we're going counter, we're going clockwise, it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> and we have the winged lion, and below that we have a kind of bloated eagle. 
<laughs> we have John, and then we have Luke, the wisdom order. Now, Kells is about uh, 800. This is early, and very important. The book of Kells expresses a very important exponent of the church, uh, keeping a process alive in many, many ways. Interestingly, the wisdom of Kells, the wisdom of that period of it, Ireland, made its way next to the Carolinian world. And there was a production of illuminated Bibles in, centered in Tours uh, that maintains the wisdom order. Amazingly. So if you turn the page, this is Christ in Majesty from the Vivian Bible. This is a fantastic uh, illustration, uh, highly, uh, the aesthetics are fantastic and the thought is quite complex. But let's see. So, cherchez <laughs> le Matthew. Uh, you always look for Matthew um, first, right? So, can you find Matthew around Christ and Majesty? The winged man. Does anybody see it? Uh, just around the figure, it'll be to the right, to, to his left hand, to Christ's left hand, the winged man. You see? Okay, uh, now, this is going to be different. Look at Christ's abdomen. Isn't that cosmic swirl fantastic? Go through the cosmic swirl to the right of Jesus, and you have the winged lion. You're crossing through the center. Then, where is, um, where is John? Yeah, the top. And then, where is Luke? bottom. Again, you, you go through the center. So, uh, I think we have a third process here. Um, if you intuit the, the one that we don't have, um, the Bruno Shia process, sorry, I'll get back in the frame. Um, if you intuit that, you've got John in the center. And um, Matthew and Mark spiraling into the center, and then Luke spiraling out. Very soon, uh, we have the graphic representations of the four actually circling a figure in the middle, except in Kells, go back a page, where is Christ in majesty? It, it, but you just have the cross. Yeah, you just have the cross, you just have the center. So, um, in Mandela studies, you call that an unmanifested center. It's the unmanifest. It's God as the un, unshaped um, so that um, is actually behind, in the dimensionality of the mandala of India and Tibet, that unmanifest center is underneath, if you can imagine it, underneath whatever figure is in the middle, the flower with the Buddha in the center, they are flowing out of the, the center of the unmanifest. They're coming out of the mystery. Yes. You, you know, so you can picture that, right? But now you're looking right into the mystery with Kells. With the Vivian Bible, you have now Christ in majesty in the center, and the four around it, but now instead of either circling into the center or circling around the center, they are moving through the center to make their progression. So from Matthew to Mark, you always look for Matthew and Mark because that order is unalterable. And then in the wisdom pattern, we look for uh, John, and we find it at the top. But to get to Luke, you have to go through the center again. So another wisdom process, perhaps. And finally, um, we have uh, Master of Hugo, Christ in Majesty. A little later, the Bury Bible, 1135 of the Christian era. Uh, and here, tell me what you see. Where is uh, Matthew? Upper left. Upper left. Okay, that's not a great sign um, to begin with, but okay, where is Mark? Bottom right. Bottom left. Bottom left. Winged lion. So what direction are we going? Okay, but so far we don't know if it's the canonical order or the wisdom order, right? What's next? If you go in left to right, it would be Luke. 
It would be Luke, and that's correct, right? Because we have nothing taking us through the center, right? Mark is uh, below Matthew, so we would proceed to the right, and there is Luke. So we are going counterclockwise in what order? The canonical order. We've forgotten. The wisdom order has been forgotten by this time. The mandalic process has been forgotten by this time. Even the geometry of the figure supports what you just said. You know? Yeah. yeah. Say more about that. I see what you mean. Go ahead. Say, say well, more. I'm just, I just mean, the, the, you know, it's a rectangular shape. Yeah, it's very geometric. Well, I mean, actually, this one is too. But yeah, but there's a lot of organic stuff going yeah. on in the one before. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 So, um, so this process, um, what, what, what changed? From the unseen process of Bruno and Alexander, what would drive it to uh, Christ in majesty in the center? Now I'd like to uh, address that so that we could talk about the future of wisdom in this mandalic process. I would not uh, at all suggest that any of the processes we've been talking about that have a historical arc are best approached for the future by return to the past, but rather uh, by asking how these are genuinely traditioned, that is, moving the past creatively into the future in reference to what the contemporary is calling for. What is, what is, the, what is the call of the now that is asking us uh, for something new? So um, I think the Christ in majesty, I'm just, this is all just, you know, me, um, unprovable, any of it, uh, but worth talking about. The Christ in majesty, of course, comes uh, from Hebrew scripture pictures of the tetramorphs uh, circling around the throne of God, but it, it reaches in the Christian world, it's from the book of Revelation, of course. And there, I would say to you that um, what the revelator is, is proposing is replacing the emperor with Christ, but Christ who is triumphant. So we are still in the imperial thought world. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, we've replaced the emperor of Rome with a heavenly emperor, but it, we, we are increasingly in that world focusing on the Pantocrator, mm -hmm. Christ as the ruler and judge of all things. And this is a shift, isn't it? From the, the figure over the baptistry in Dura Europus, which is what? Go back and look. The Good Shepherd. Yeah, as you know, that was the dominant image of Christ for the first five centuries of Christianity. No crucifixes, and the dominant image was the Good Shepherd. By this time, by the time that we've lost the wisdom pattern, by the time we have Christ in majesty, we also have a plethora of crucifixes. So we are focused on uh, the suffering and dying Christ and Christ who is the judge of the world. And so this imperial model, which becomes our model with Constantine, uh, is now completely, uh, completely dominating everything. So if we're going to ask, could we recover a wisdom mandalic process for our communities and our individuals, nature, healing herself, I would say that we would be looking for another center. A center that would be evocative of what we need uh, for today. A non-dominant center, a non-dominating center, a non-patriarchal center. Um, what, might, what might go in the center? Uh, Sheila and I were talking this morning and uh, she mentioned something that we've talked about before a long, long ago. If uh, The Bible, too. So, uh, you know, from Bruno's work of a word mandala, one gospel, uh, I've expanded the idea to one gospel with three around it. But, of course, uh, people who look at the pattern of the Bible have been talking about the whole shape of the Bible. That's a very, very complex picture. But we know that it starts with a garden, and interestingly, it ends with the same garden. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about that, but where the, the book of Revelation ends is where the book of Genesis begins. How do we know that? 
What's, what's the marker that we're back in, the, in paradise at the end? Well, what's there? River or tree? River or tree, perfect. <laughs> uh, ex what exactly, and which tree? There is a, it, it, it's the tree of life. So we know we're back where we started. But there's a huge, huge difference. It's, it's a spiral, you see. It's not a return to where we were before. What's the big difference? I'm a Lord. Sorry? The apocalyptic cry, I'm a Lord. Yes, but something shows up in the middle of the garden, in the end of the book of Revelation. You know this. The city. Jerusalem <laughs> sets down like a spaceship in the middle of paradise. <laughs> forgot about that, I know. Uh, now, the, the great uh, um, theologian, sociologist Jacques Ellul points out that the first thing that Cain does after God marks Cain, after the murder of his brother, he gets married, and then what does he do? He builds a city. The first city is the production of the murderer Cain. You're really good. I gave it. Gave it. <laughs> the city is being redeemed here at the end of time, at the end of this enormous narration that has gone on for story after story, after book after book, after millennium after millennium. The city, which is marked with the mark of Cain, is being redeemed at the center of the garden. So, do you remember how that city is described? I'm just going to read, uh, read it to you. Vision of the New Jerusalem. One of the seven angels who held the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke to me. Come, he said, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So in the spirit, he carried me away to a great and lofty mountain and showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, it had the radiance of some priceless jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great and lofty wall with twelve gates, at which were stationed twelve angels. On the gates were inscribed the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates to the east, three to the north, three to the south, and three to the west. The city wall had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who spoke with me carried a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city had four sides, and it was as wide as it was long. Measured by his rod, it was 12,000 furlongs, its length and breadth and height being equal. Its wall was 144 cubits high by human measurements, which the angel used. The wall was built of jasper, while the city itself was of pure gold, bright as clear glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with precious stones of every kind, the first of the foundation stones being jasper, the second lapis lazuli, the third chalcedony, and the fourth emerald. The fifth sardonyx, and the sixth cornelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh turquoise, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate fashioned from a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like translucent glass. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple was the sovereign Lord God and the Lamb. The city did not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb. Isn't that a beautiful vision? It seems to me like a flower made of stone. And in the center of the flower is, is, Christ. is Christ. And Christ is both the center and the illumination of, of the center. So that's a possible center for our time, the redemption of the city. Uh, as some people, the, the oldest city is probably Jericho. Um, it's 10,000 years old. It's, uh, some people consider that the downfall of humanity was, uh, was urbanism, uh, and, and thus the story is true of Cain building a city as a sign of the fall of humanity. 
The, the narrative of Joseph is the narrative of kingly domination, using urban powers to enslave people for their good, so that we can avoid play, um, famine by storing up food. So the redemption of the city uh, today stands for sustainability in our ecological and environmental life, uh, I would say. That we could think about a center being how we, who live so divorced from the earth, uh, which is the matrix uh, from which we come, that uh, the, the saving of that city, its reintegration, its, uh, its, its salvation, uh, might become the new center of a mandalic process. But there, there are other um, candidates, and I think the idea that there are myriad of candidates, in other words, in a, in a world that is no longer hierarchically, or we hope, hierarchically ordered, there might be as many candidates as you can dream. Uh, Mary Magdalene might be a great candidate to go in the center of uh, this mandala. Not an idealized woman, Sophia, but a woman uh, who knew Jesus and was his best friend. Um, there might be a community in the center of the mandala process. Uh, we might see Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, the three of them, in the center. We might have a divine marriage uh, in the center of, of the mandala. Uh, whatever will promote the health and the recentration of a fragmented world might become the new center of the mandala. The mandala process could, could be renewed as well. This is what um, we might invite into our communities. Uh, how could we help people move through these life questions? How to, to deal with change? How to deal with suffering? How to receive blessing in our lives? And how to serve the world? Um, symbolized by this mandala. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mark, do you want to just yeah, continue can, with Yeah, questions? we have some questions. Yeah. Or comments or